Well, it's finally a pleasure to uh, interact more with, with my colleagues in, in, uh, in kind of plant breeding colleagues. Mostly, I, I interact with, uh, with the uh, plant breeding colleagues in Geneva, Susan Brown, who thinks that she has, she's got the best crop because she grows apples. I grow roots, so <laughs> I get teased a lot by, uh, by them. And then Phil Griffiths, who uh, breeds cabbages, uh, and I grow roots. So. But we'll see how important roots, uh, roots are for, uh, for production um, of apples. So um, a little bit about the, uh, uh, the breeding program. Um, it's actually a cooperation between uh, uh, the USDA and Cornell, or Cornell and the USDA. Uh, the, initi the initial people that uh, started the program were Herb Wilcombe Herb right here and Jim Cummins. And in the middle is Terence Robinson. They, they were uh, doing the uh, breeding and horticulture. Um, this is uh, Charlie. Uh, he passed away a few years back, but I'd like to remember him because many of the trees that you'll see in the ground and, and, and used in our experiments were uh, uh, his, his hands touched. Uh, and uh, Sarah Bauer and Tal Hauran are technicians in our, in our breeding program. So I'd like to recognize uh, them and I'd also like to uh, point out that we have the largest collection of apples in the world uh, up there in Geneva. Um, uh, Thomas Chow, a, a, colleague, a, a good colleague of mine, is uh, the curator and, and uh, he's, he's always happy to, to have students. And I think uh, some of the uh, plant breeding students have been there uh, in September, year after year. Um, so those are, that's, that's one jewel that we have. Sometimes it's a little known. And uh, the breeding program, the Apple Rooster Breeding Program, enjoys collaborations with many, many, many different institutions. Uh, anywhere that uh, pretty much uh, most institutions that are studying apples are also studying or working with apples are also working with apple rootstocks. So, um, and uh, different areas from genomics to uh, bioinformatics and uh, plant path, uh, root biology, and, and so on and so forth. So a little bit about the history of the breeding program. So I must have been a twinkle in my parents' eye uh, when, uh, when it all got started in 1968, uh, where Dr. Cummins and uh, Al Winkle and, uh, I don't know, have you guys heard of Randy Gardner? He's a tomato breeder in uh, North Carolina State. Anyway, they identified Robusta 5 as fi fire blight resistant, uh, resist uh, resistant to fire blight. That was important. The focus of the breeding program was to breed disease resistant rootstocks uh, and to provide them to the, uh, to the industry. So 1978 came by, 98, the first release, it's not very, grown very much. Uh, G65, second release, and, and uh, uh, in 1998, the USDA ARS, after Jim Cummins retired, the USDA ARS took the, the lead of the program, took over the lead of the program uh, for uh, financial reasons and, and because Cornell was not gonna uh, continue it anymore. And uh, uh, we've had, the majority of, of releases just in the past few years. Uh, when USDA joined the group, the production of Geneva rootstocks per year was about uh, 100,000 uh, pieces. And uh, right now, we, the, uh, the rootstock program has, uh, they, well, rootstock from the rootstock program uh, account for about 4 million uh, pieces or three trees per year being planted. So uh, pretty, pretty huge growth and, and uh, it's, but every, you know, perhaps most students, um, at least when I was a graduate student, I had no idea what apple root stocks were. I, I knew what tomatoes and, and cucumbers and everything else, but so apple root stocks, going back, uh, every, every commercial apple tree, it's a method of propagation, uh, they, uh, they're grafted onto uh, a, a different root system or different genotype. So uh, initially they, these were, uh, they just used seedlings uh, for rootstocks, but in the 1700s something changed. They noticed uh, that some rootstocks had certain properties that, that were better than others, and, 
And, uh, and the apple rootstock story began uh, then. Um, they're mostly propagated clonally uh, by layering and stooling. And this is what the uh, finished product that the nursery, the apple rootstock nursery sells to uh, the finished tree nursery. Uh, they're basically rooted, rooted uh, sticks. And uh, these rooted sticks get transferred into uh, a uh, uh, finished tree nursery. As you can see right here, this is Charlie and this is Todd's, uh, Todd Holland's hands. Um, he's putting a little tiny chip bud um, of, uh, I don't know, it could be your favorite variety, Honeycrisp, uh, Gala, uh, Macintosh, uh, Snapdragon. And, uh, and these are grown um, in, in, uh, in the nursery for one year or two years, depending on, on the type of tree that's being made. And, uh, and then this is a huge field of apple trees. They're all on G202, uh, one of the Geneva rootstocks that, uh, that uh, we uh, released. And of course, from there, they make it into orchards. But I'd like to, so what we produce is actually the finished product. Um, and, and so our, our breeding program is, is very, very much in touch with, with apple growers. Uh, we visit with apple growers routinely, uh, try to get feedback um, uh, from them. And um, we're also a very international program as we have uh, field trials and, and uh, also commercial interest in, in Europe. Uh, Brazil, New Zealand, China, well, China, they, we kind of find out later that, that they took some of the rootstocks, but <laughs> Mexico, uh, France, um, Belgium, England, Netherlands, South Africa. Uh, we have uh, field trials in South Korea. I don't have pictures for those, but pretty much everywhere where uh, 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 apples are grown, they have very strong interest in, in our plant material. So, um, in the U.S. also, uh, there's huge interest, and so we have field trials and uh, plantings uh, in pretty much all the uh, apple-producing uh, states in, in the U.S. Mexico, uh, uh, Canada, I was, last week I, I was in uh, Nova Scotia, and, and uh, I got a chance to look at some of our trees. So th th we're, we're very well connected as a, as a breeding program with our customers. Uh, we go visit them every year and, and we hear the complaints and also we hear the, the good stories. These are some of the good stories. This is a brand new business that basically bases business on, on Geneva rootstocks uh, in, uh, in Oregon. This is a field of G41. I'm just gonna go th quickly through these. Uh, this is another Oregon nursery and uh, another huge Oregon nursery. This is the largest producer in, in the world of rootstocks. Uh, and another Oregon nursery which uh, figured out how to uh, propagate uh, our material by cuttings uh, instead of uh, just by stooling and layering. Uh, so, uh, and they've expanded that production. They put in 10 new greenhouses two years ago and, and, uh, and we love it uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it brings out the good name and, and it shows the, the good properties of, of the breeding that, that, uh, that we've done. Um, our, our, our plants are also being micropropagated uh, by the hundreds of thousands uh, in, in the U.S. and, and uh, around the world. So there's another family operated nursery in Washington State and that's a huge field of, now these are all going to become trees. Uh, that, uh, that get planted uh, in uh, orchards, sometimes in your backyards if you, uh, if you buy them. Um, that was the largest uh, up, uh, fruit, fruit, fruit company in, in the U.S. that's using our rootstocks. Cameron Nursery, another Washington Nursery. So, all right, back to rootstocks. Um, Apple rootstocks have to go, have to live in an interesting environment. Lots of interactions going on. Um, we have uh, interactions with the soil, pH type, structure, nutrients, so you know, anywhere where the roots are. The science variety also provides another interaction where certain science uh, 
may uh, certain rootstocks may interact with with certain sign varieties in in interesting way. I'll give you a little bit of data uh, later on. Climate, of course, temperature, water, uh, diseases, and insects, and what I call the uh, 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 tractor blight or orchard management. Uh, so, uh, so it has to also interact with with how a person manages the uh, the orchard and uh, it, within within the soil the the interactions that go within the soil we we've, we've done quite a bit of work uh, Ian Merwin and his group did uh, uh, quite a lot of work on on those interactions and uh, but there is a lot more to be done so I, I invite you if you want a nice model system uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, that has a 30-year cycle uh, <laughs> To come to come and and, uh, and and work with us, but um, so so we we have uh, uh, elucidated uh, some relationships that, that are going on in, in, in the root system, uh, where some root systems are promoting certain uh, uh, types of uh, of bacteria or fungi and and not others. So, what does the root system do in the orchard? Um, sometimes we all we focus a lot on, on when, as traits on, on, on the top part and yield and, and things like that, and we don't think much about what's going on under under the uh, uh, under that soil uh, profile in the soil profile. So we, we see that in apples, it modifies tree architecture. Okay, not only by dwarfing, but by uh, um, uh, sometimes making the branch structure. Uh, a little more open. The root, the root systems, they interface with the soil, uh, so you have a penetration, the anchorage, pH, uh, microbes, uh, they also compete with other roots, uh, so you have that uh, uh, level of, of complexity, but it also collects nutrients and water, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, it fights infections and survives in the climate. So anything that you can do to make a root system work better and be less stressed, it, uh, it basically ends up improving uh, what's, what's happening on the top. So this is a graft union, uh, two different genotypes. You can see the darker genotype is the, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the rootstock and the lighter genotype uh, is the cyan. And there's a lot that goes on through the graft union. And I think uh, uh, this was a, a, an image that was produced by the Cornell Biotech Imaging Facility. Mark Richel, uh, I applaud him. Uh, but we're, we're uh, learning more and more uh, about root to shoot communications with, uh, with the Apple model system. So I think, I think our group uh, um, was the first to really publish the, uh, or yes, we, we were the first to publish um, the, the notion that root, system, root systems or different root systems can change the transcriptome of science in, in quite a radical way. And uh, this was work done with, with uh, Penn State and uh, <coughs> NSF grant, and they, uh, um, it was based on a nimble uh, chip, but basically they, we uh, uh, grafted the same cyan on different rootstocks and, and then uh, did RNA analysis on the cyan to see what, what, uh, what changes or what changed. So we found a lot of very interesting things about that. Uh, what's inversely proportional is the fact that the cyan also uh, can affect the root systems, and we don't, we haven't had, uh, we're trying to produce that data in the next few years. Uh, so, um, breeding apple rootstocks, I don't expect you to read all the uh, um, different things, but we have a plan, and although it's a, it's a, um, <coughs> it's a very long-term plan, this is a span of 30 years, uh, right there. And we have stages in which, uh, in which we perform certain, certain actions. Uh, this is, in yellow, is the uh, plan if we didn't have marker-assisted breeding or genomics or omics breeding. And the lower part is with the omics breeding, what we can do and you know, the fact that we can shorten the time a little bit. Um, 
but it doesn't take away from the requirement that once, you, once we think that we have a finished product, it needs to go everywhere and, we need to, and it needs to be widely tested. And that's something that I think uh, in the uh, people talking about uh, transgenics and GMO is, uh, GMOs or, or other uh, products is that when uh, for perennial crops, even if you have, if, even if you put that gene in, one gene and make that transformation, you still have to evaluate it for a number of years for a perennial crop before you can say that it actually does something and, and, it, and, uh, and has, uh, it doesn't have any negative repercussions on, on the productivity. So food for thought, you can't, you can't bypass uh, field trials. So um, why omics assisted breeding? I, I call it omics because uh, we're dealing with transcriptome and, and genomics. It's uh, essentially it's 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 this uh, money thing that uh, seems to be in a limited uh, uh, available in, in limited amounts in, in breeding programs, um, especially the apple rooster breeding program. But if we can plant, uh, so stage one we we'd like to kill as many trees as possible uh, with. Uh, uh, fire blight, photophthora, or anything else. So uh, we're good killers. But even, even the best killers, we still end up with, with a lot of, of uh, stuff that we don't want. And, uh, and if, we had, if we had to put all those trees and replications in the field, it, our orchards would go hectares and hectares and hectares, uh, just huge. So, uh, and each tree costs about $15 per year to, to maintain. So you do the math. A, uh, now a GBS or a SNP, the <coughs> SNP chip uh, is uh, $24 plus. Uh, so two or three years, it's, it's cost effective to, to know more about uh, that. So in the breeding strategy, we're trying to use all the omics tools, markers, maps, sequences, uh, microarrays, RNAC, HPLC. Uh, we're trying to figure out what the functional alleles are or um, uh, marker alleles, and of course we collect a lot of phenotypes uh, uh, where one of the advantages that we have, and I'll talk a little bit more later, but the fact that we can replicate an apple tree millions of times. Um, so uh, we, can, we can study a lot. So if we could take some of those, those uh, genotypes, uh, for example in stage three, four, and five, uh, and uh, and just reduce them uh, to the to the numbers that we want or to what we want uh, at the molecular level, uh, where we're assured that that they're good. Then um, uh, we can save quite a bit of money in the breeding program and also come up with a, still come up with a decent product. The idea is to, of course, increase replications uh, to the to the nth. Uh, by and it's similar to other breeding programs, by uh, as as things progress from one stage to another. Um, so, breeding apple rootstocks there are advantages and disadvantages, of course. The advantages, uh, grafting. It's it's nice to be able to graft onto something and and propagate it many many times. Uh, we can do repeated measures year after year, and we can interrogate the same. Uh, the same plant in the, in, uh, in the same physiological stage, uh, time over time over time. Of course, you have to wait a year or a season. Uh, but we can do that. Uh, high clonal replications and the ability to uh, uh, study the clone by environment interaction by, of course, placing it in, uh, in many places. And uh, we also enjoy very high genetic diversity. Uh, so apples is a uh, apples are an ancient tetraploid, uh, but there are also disadvantages. Very long generation times. Most of the time, we don't measure uh, things on on the root uh, root system or on the rootstock. We measure it on the scion. So that adds a, 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 a different layer of complexity to to whatever we do. Then there are rootstock-scion interactions, which um, 
also also is is uh, something that we have to deal with statistically, and the root phenotypes are difficult to uh, to measure. Okay, so how many people are working on root systems here? Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you got only one one of you put put their hands up. So only the Okay, only the bravest of the brave work with the root system. <laughs> so be brave. Uh, okay, so I gave a few breathing examples where uh, we've done conventional analysis, QTN analysis, uh, and uh, transcriptome analysis, and then uh, uh, looking at joining the transcriptome to the uh, metabolome of, uh, of apple rootstocks. This is what trees look like. Uh, a hundred years ago, a long time ago, that's because they used uh, mostly seedling rootstocks. Um, you were telling me about seedling rootstocks, this is what your trees look like. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of blow, blow your mind. This is what apple trees look like in a, in a commercial production. Every apple is hung in a specific spot of the tree so that it gets the maximum um, nutrients uh, and the maximum uh, exposure to the sun or other things that are, are done. So it, this is, uh, and that's because this, in this model you get, uh, you get to sell more apples of high quality. So quite a bit different. Uh, and, uh, and there are uh, orchards that are making lots of money uh, because of, you know, they, they pick the right stuff. I, especially here in, in New York State. But it, this would not be possible, it would not have been possible if it wasn't for a, uh, a couple of genes, uh, maybe a few more than that, from that couple, but uh, two genes that uh, confer the dwarfing ability of, a, of apple rootstock. So these trees were planted at the same time, and uh, uh, one is full of apples, one, the other one is not. Uh, one is dwarf, one is growing fruit, the other one is growing wood. So rootstocks are able to partition uh, the uh, production of apples from, fr uh, from fruit to wood. Oh my gosh. Okay, I need to hurry up here. So that's, that's how important the uh, uh, apples are. In the dwarfing research, we used uh, two mapping populations. Uh, we had six different field trials. Uh, so confirm and confirm, and then I wanted to sit on, on the genes uh, a little bit longer. Uh, QTL analysis, MapQTL, you know, with the traditional stuff that you all use, uh, jump nine or 10 or 11, and then the, uh, we validated actually all, all of our work in, in uh, and we continue to validate in all of our breeding population. So we published last year uh, this uh, <coughs> work, DW2, uh, and uh, where we showed uh, the, its relationship to productivity of, of apple trees. Essentially, uh, uh, heterozygous individuals for DW1 and DW2 uh, pr are, you know, produce a nice size tree and, uh, and yet have the highest uh, yield uh, per, uh, uh, per tree. So we can now uh, reliably um, use molecular markers for those and I, th I think we've identified one or two of the genes or the lack of genes uh, in, and uh, we've used a lot of the genomic resources. Uh, Ed Buckler, thanks for TASL. <laughs> so, and, and your group. So we, uh, we, we actually had uh, in a project uh, we produced at, at the Plant Genetic Resources Unit, uh, we produced uh, a lot of GBAS data on, 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 on apples and uh, Angela Baldo <coughs> put it in tassel in the raw form and I just go with it. So I, I can take any, any snippet of, of, uh, of apple and say and interrogate a uh, number of uh, varieties. I know which ones are rootstocks and which ones are not and I can say, oh, you know, this is, this is what's, uh, what's good in this group or, or for rootstocks or for disease resistance or also and so on, so on and so forth. So we utilize a lot of the uh, same uh, genomic uh, things. This is, uh, of course, uh, one of the first things that I, I did or I tried to do as soon as I had the chance is uh, uh, 
a luminal sequencing uh, of, uh, of uh, our parents, Rusox, and then alignment to the apple genome. Why is that important? Well, it's important for uh, um, identifying the specific alleles, making specific primers or, or assays for, for the breeding program. So I develop the, uh, the assays and, and they're used in-house uh, to, to select for dwarfing. And, uh, and this is how we actually, it's a good thing, this is how we survive. So uh, changing gears a little bit, and we talked about how um, I, I, I mentioned that rootstocks actually influenced uh, how, uh, how fruit is. And I think, I, I, I think, and I, 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 I'm be beginning to believe a lot more uh, that even taste is influenced by, by uh, the taste of apple. You can take a gala grown on one rootstock and, and, and another, and, and they might taste different, depending on what the rootstock does to, to the cyan. So I said it changes tree architecture, um, changes water availability. But what we found out in the past few years through a uh, collaboration with Terence Robinson, Mike Rusak, and, and uh, um, other, uh, other folks in our group, is that they, uh, <coughs> there are huge changes in, in nutrient availability that the rootstocks do uh, or, or send, to the, send up to the cyan. And of course, phytohormones uh, are another uh, area that's, that's interesting that's, uh, and how the changes in uh, at the apple tree. So I'd like to show this picture because uh, these, these are all gala apples. Uh, most of you have, have uh, tasted them, but these are gala apple. All these have been grown on, on a different rootstock. And there are changes in color, fruit size, you can see that changes in color right here uh, on average uh, and uh, fruit size and and also you'll see later that there are ch also changes in firmness and bricks uh, so things that uh, perhaps that you can taste and perhaps even uh, changes in acidity based on on uh, on what they have inside so <coughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mineral nutrients um, there's a journey that the mineral nutrients take uh, from, from the soil uh, profile they go into the root system through hairs and then, then you have different sinks, leaves and, and uh, uh, fruit and um, uh, let's say branches, wood that's being produced um, and it's all, it, all these nutrients are being partitioned in certain times in, uh, in the cyan. But one way to, to know uh, what a rootstock does is to look at a series of different rootstocks and measure what's going up in, in, the, uh, in the cyan. And then you, as, you create assays on all the cyan. It's all the same cyan that's been grafted on, on, uh, on different rootstocks. And so you know what's going, well, uh, you know what's going in or what's going up by measuring uh, the same cyan. Um, so you know what's in the soil, and this is kind of like the filter. The rootstock is the filter for these nutrients. So we did a bunch of, of uh, analysis uh, on uh, uh, both a diverse, uh, diversity panels uh, and uh, structure populations of, of rootstock, so uh, segregating populations so to uh, identify QTLs. And uh, here we go. And we produced... Um, a bit of work that looked at the interactions of, of uh, uh, the rootstocks by uh, the pH of the soil. And Ali is, is continuing that work. We also looked at apple replant disease and the soil type and the influences that, that they may have on different rootstock genotypes. And, uh, and, we, uh, and, and uh, for, for me, uh, it's important to be able to say, okay, so these uh, varieties are different, but What's, what are the genes behind it, or what are the QTLs behind this, this, these changes? And uh, so we uh, also produced uh, work that looked at uh, the genetics of, of uh, uh, apple rootstock nutrition. This is what the experiments look like. Uh, uh, and uh, this is Darius Kvicklis, who 
uh, produced uh, most of the initial data <coughs> is a scientist from, uh, visiting scientist from Lithuania. And so I'm just going to mention a little bit about the, uh, the, gene the genetic mapping because it yielded, again, uh, some markers that are important for us uh, for uh, marker-assisted uh, or omics selection. So uh, we tested 84 different rootstocks, replicated uh, n times, uh, four to six times, and in, in, the, in the same uh, in one type of uh, soil, uh, Cornell mix. And this is what the uh, that experiment looked like. Uh, and then we took leaves from the sign. The sign, I think, it's uh, Gala. Uh, in in that case, and uh, we analyzed mineral concentrations in in the leaves of that of that sign to understand what what was happening. What we found was that well, if we if you if we look at 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 the data, we found that there were some relationships that. Uh, between certain classes of mineral nutrients. So a very strong relationship between uh, magnesium and calcium. They're both two plus uh, things. Uh, another very strong relationship be between phosphorus and, and, and potassium. And we've done a lot of experiments and this relationship seems to be, uh, uh, genetic relationship seems to be very strong uh, still. Um, and then some of the other um, uh, uh, ions, uh, uh, metal ions, sodium, uh, manganese, iron, kind of uh, uh, put themselves together. Uh, but this relationship, uh, so we have data now, uh, metric data on, uh, on nutrients. And of course we did the uh, uh, QTL studies uh, that uh, most of you are familiar with. This is a uh, QTL for uh, uh, Potassium uh, concentration, um, the rootstock media potassium concentration. We uh, uh, can take it down to the uh, to the allele level, and and I think we we've, we've identified the gene that's responsible for it. Uh, but um, it can change potassium concentration in the leaves, and we found out also in the fruit by uh, 35, 25 to 35 percent, which I think it has a, uh, it would have a significant physiological uh, uh, influence on, on how the tree grows. But when you look at the whole map of all, of all the nutrients uh, and the QTLs that are associated with nutrient uptake, and some of these may be well, very well associated with, with yield, uh, things that, you know, part of, part of that uh, uh, yield and quality in the, in the scion. It, the map is pretty, becomes pretty complicated, but there are some hot spots where uh, things that are correlated uh, or nutrients that are correlated kind of uh, the, there's a QTL for, for uh, all, of, all of the different uh, um, uh, correlated uh, uh, nutrients at the same uh, location. Uh, it shows up like that. So that was easy because we did it in pots. And, uh, and we use Cornell mix. But then the question was, how, so how many times have you gone out into the field and, and found out that everything that you knew about and, and discovered in the greenhouse completely was obliterated? So, so okay, so we wanted to make sure that, that what we were seeing was, was actually true. And, and so we have a, uh, this is a uh, Google, I love Google Maps. Uh, <coughs> is a picture uh, of, of the orchard where we had the same population replicated uh, with, uh, uh, with apple trees. And now we took leaves and fruit and, and measured uh, nitrogen, NPK, calcium, zinc, copper, all of that good, good stuff. And, uh, and of course, we, in some cases, we got some nice, uh, some, some nice modal distributions. Uh, and some did not look very modal, but, uh, and that's a good thing in some cases because there was a major gene segregating. So we could pick it up. And in fact, uh, the marker associated with the high potassium, here it is in, the, in this huge correlation uh, matrix. But I just, I just took the ones that, that the, uh, the nutrients that are uh, strongly correlated 
and that's that that would that highlighted is the marker, which is kind of warming. And and then when we did the QTL analysis with the uh, with the uh, uh, trees in the field, there it is, number uh, chromosome number five, and and uh, same stuff. So it's uh, you know, f but this was one of the stronger, uh, strongest QTLs. The other stuff kind of got, uh, so it wasn't, it, it needed a little bit more uh, massaging uh, with, uh, with the data doing, uh, had, uh, I had to do a spatial analysis uh, and thanks now, uh, SAS, uh, J JMP has a spatial analysis uh, uh, module for it and it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I, I, I've done it. I've, I've done it by hand, and it's not good. So why why are nutrients, or why is selection for nutrients relevant for breeding? Well, for one thing, uh, there there's, there are a lot of people predicating on the fact that we need to mm, uh, be more efficient at, at uh, how we fertilize. Uh, we apply fertilizers in in the field, um, but. Uh, here it is, fruit calcium uh, is uh, something that's very important in the minds and hearts of people that store apples for a long period of time because uh, uh, the lack of, of fruit calcium or uh, lower concentrations of fruit calciums are associated with some of the uh, uh, post harvest diseases of apples uh, and not just apples. I think it's, it's pretty much uh, uh, lo lots of uh, uh, temperate fruits uh, have this, this issue. So, so what happens if I select uh, high uh, fruit, uh, fruit phosphorus and uh, plants, uh, rootstocks that do high fruit phosphorus and fruit uh, potassium? Well, I get a different type of distribution in, in, in calcium. And so I, right now I'm, I'm looking for perhaps this, these rootstocks right here that still have high, high, and then also high on, on, on calcium. Um, and this goes into, in, so we're, we're, we're trying to breed rootstocks that uh, are able to uh, match the nutritional requirements of, of different science. Honeycrisp, uh, who, have you tasted Honeycrisp? Okay, have you tasted a bad Honeycrisp before? Yes, uh, I have. So, so um, Honeycrisp is, is one of those that's uh, calcium challenged and, uh, and figuring out something that, um, that is able to, or a rootstock that is able to uh, better send calcium up to, the, up, up to that apple is very important for, for, uh, for the industry. So um, I like these plots because they, they tell me a lot uh, this is actually a segregating population, and we're looking at uh, fruit nitrogen, sulfur, magnesium, uh, and then bricks, and firmness, and phosphorus, calcium, and then the, this is the uh, yield and fruit size. And so we're seeing that, that there is a relationship between uh, what we're seeing in mineral nutrients and fruit quality parameters. So again, an apple grown on one rootstock is perhaps different than uh, if grown in, on another rootstock. So as part of that, uh, that research, uh, we have uh, uh, been funded by the uh, New York Couple of Research and Development Board to uh, conduct a survey. We have several rootstock, uh, apple rootstock trials in, in the state of New York. And so we wanted to conduct a survey uh, of, uh, this is Honeycrisp, uh, uh, Gala, I think we have Fuji and, and, Golden, and uh, Golden Delicious. So um, a root of what the rootstocks do in different soils. And uh, it's a project that's going right now. I'm not going to show any data on that. But I think we're going to be able to link markers uh, to, to uh, certain markers to rootstock performance in uh, certain types of soils. Uh, and different pHs and, and, and nutrient availability. So that's going to, I think it's, this is very exciting for, for growing apples uh, or in the future. Okay, so uh, switch gears. Oh gosh, I only have 10 minutes. Is it 12.10? Or, or one, uh, what, what time? 1.10 one, one, one that we have to end? 
Okay. So uh, we did a little bit of uh, um, uh, oh, uh, more than a little bit of omics stuff. So we uh, mapped gene expression signatures on uh, on a population of upper rootstocks, uh, and uh, came up with about. Uh, so, so we performed twenty six thousand. Uh, QTL analysis with MacQTL, which was uh, uh, thanks to uh, David Strickland, who uh, created some some uh, magic with the macros. Uh, but we produced uh, expression QTLs in in the, in the same rootstock population that now you have seen in the field uh, and in in all of these uh, different tests, and came up with. Uh, uh, essentially 26,000 traits to uh, put on the QTL map and, and, and produce that. Um, and some uh, traits produced, uh, um, uh, how do you say, significant QTLs, and some, of course, didn't. They were randomly. So this is, uh, an, uh, these are examples for, for uh, uh, EQTLs for one of the, uh, 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 gene, genes that we assayed. This is on chromosome 17, and um, and sure enough, uh, actually this is on chromosome 12. Uh, this is a LOD. You know what? You all know what an LOD is. It's an LOD of about 12. Um, so it's a very, very highly significant uh, QTL. And if I could show, perhaps, it, the the distribution would look like like this, having two two different. Uh, uh, being bimodal, two different types, and it's basically it's the the gene is segregating one to one in in the population. So so we published uh, this work uh, talking about gene expression markers. Uh, I used the uh, this EQTL data set as a basis to find diverse diversity uh, gene diversity in uh, uh, <coughs> in for uh, developing uh, uh, molecular markers that I could use in a uh, breeding program. And uh, uh, so we, we mapped a lot of these in apples. We, uh, if, and sometimes we used gene expression uh, itself uh, as a marker if it was really truly bimodal. Um, one thing that is cool about apples is that you can go back to the same population a year later, or two years, or three years later, uh, but harvest it at the same physiological stage, and the uh, expression QTLs are reproducible. And that's what we found in, in when we, when we uh, did this publication. So we, we, came, we came back, we produced the first microarray data, and then we came back to it three years later. Same plants, harvested at the same time uh, in, in, in the field, and uh, most, of, most of the EQTLs were uh, uh, were congruent with the initial data, so that's that's nice. So how um, e so EQTLs may be themselves linked to the trait of interest, or they may not. They just they're just there next to some something some other feature in the DNA that's hitching a ride that's causing the the phenotype. But um, in, this is the case for uh, powdery mildew resistance. Uh, it's a, a gene cro located on, uh, on chromosome 12. So we can, we can uh, take um, EQTLs that are in sync with, uh, with the resistance, uh, meaning that uh, the different classes offer the same gene expression, and uh, we, we can uh, uh, create markers. We can identify thing the uh, of course, plants that uh, uh, are interesting uh, to to assay, and and uh, and find that the uh, um, how you call those the polymorphisms that are causing the differential expression in in these plants. From a global uh, from a from a global uh, perspective, though, when we looked at all of these EQTLs and then uh, put them onto the uh, genome, and this is I think this is the only chromosome two. Uh, uh, what we found is was that there are a few hotspots for for EQTLs, and they they're hotspots for cis and trans 
uh, EQTLs, meaning some, some, uh, some of those EQTLs were uh, right there in the same location, so the same chromosome, uh, and then some were completely in a different part of the genome. But their gene expression, and this is the LOD right here, so very, uh, in, a, in a very significant way, gene expression was being modulated by segregation of pieces of DNA uh, in, in that uh, location. So we can utilize um, th that, if we can connect it, to connect it to a trait, we can utilize uh, that information to see how complex a trait is or, or, uh, or, or may be. Um, so the next part is a little bit of dabbling in metabolomics, uh, in where now we have taken the same uh, tissue that we did EQTLs uh, with and or you know from the same the same physiological tissue from the same plants um, and now measured uh, various uh, element uh, various various compounds in the phenylpropanoid pathway okay and so we get a bunch of uh, good normal distributions and of course QTLs from those distributions, the very significant QTLs. So, okay, so there's segregation for, what is this? Uh, uh, chlorogenic acid uh, and Renutrin. And this is an unknown compound, but uh, pretty strong QTLs. This one, I think, goes up to a, a LOD of 15 and a LOD of five. So, um, and then we, we uh, interrogate the uh, EQTLs with that data set or with that knowledge. We say, okay, so what EQTLs are, are in the phenylpropanoid pathway? And, and, uh, and you can pretty much quickly do a, a uh, blast and come up with different names and, and uh, functions, group them together, and voila. Uh, so this is actually a, a very strong EQTL. Um, and uh, it has an almost one-to-one -one, uh, correlation with uh, EQTLs. Uh, so this is a, uh, what's called a uh, uh, child cons isomerase in this case. And then the other ones are uh, things that are in, in future steps. But you can find, that, uh, find correlation or connection between EQTLs. What I like, though, is, is uh, looking at something like this, where now I'm looking at the, that same EQTL, and uh, these are the phenyl, uh, these compounds in the phenylpropanoid pathway. And, you can, and if you can kind of squint your eye, most of down here is green. The first one is the, uh, is the EQTL, uh, gene expression measured. Uh, and these are all, all uh, compounds or, or uh, phenolic compounds that are kind of going in sync with that, with the gene expression, with inherited gene expression uh, of, of that. So um, uh, why is this, why am I, why am I wasting my time with, with uh, phenylpropanoids pathway? Well, you know, they may be connected to some, some real traits. Like, for example, uh, we're looking at wood properties in, in apple and chlorogenic acid is a precursor of, of uh, lignin. So, yes, there is a correlation between lignin lignin concentration and the, uh, and the segregation of that gene. Uh, but we, what we're also finding, so this, these are, uh, this is a, a heat map, and, uh, and now we have the uh, genes in the phenylpropanoid pathway connected in, this, in the same data set with the uh, quercetin, resveratrol, and all the other uh, uh, anthocyanins and anthocyanidins and phenylpropanoids. And you can see that there is a, a, a uh, there are hot spots of where um, the, uh, the two data sets are connected, even, even if loosely. Uh, so uh, we can identify basically in a, in a genome, there are multiple copies of uh, chalcon isomerase, but only one or maybe a couple are responsible for uh, the traits that we're, that, that we're looking for. So to, uh, to finish, this is our, these are just a couple of examples. We have uh, lots more, but we're doing, uh, 
we continue to work on, on uh, tree nutrition and the effect on fruit quality production. We have a very, very high interest in uh, interactions with rhizospheric uh, biota. If you want to come and work with us on that, you're more than welcome to. Rootstock cyan interaction is on our uh, uh, very high, up high on, the, on our uh, um, screen. Drought tolerance, climate change, uh, disease resistance, of course, root and cyan architecture and propagation are, uh, we, we have similar work that's going on in, in all of these areas. And this is our group from last year. Um, and uh, thank you for having me over. Okay.